My name is Jim Caldwell. I'm a naval architect from uh, Defense Research and Development Canada, uh, which is in Halifax, Dartmouth area, Nova Scotia, on the East Coast. Uh, myself and Liam Gannon are going to share this presentation, which will be perfectly in 15 minutes. Um, we're talking about evaluating uh, shock mitigation seating. It's a project that's been underway for uh, about uh, two years now, probably. Um, a lot of the information we're giving here today was presented at ARENA, Royal Institution of Naval Architects Conference, in November last year. Uh, this is the reference, so this will be in the uh, presentation that uh, is distributed later. You can see it's a fairly wide cross-section of authors and countries, um, which tends to be a good way to approach this work. It's very multidisciplinary, it's very multinational. High-speed craft is, uh, I love showing these pictures. Everybody here knows these things. A lot of places we show these information, they don't, but still the pictures are, are good. Um, some of these pictures are stolen from the Human Factors Design Guideline, which Trevor negotiated usage for, I'm sure. Um, and some are um, from other sources as well, which are, which are um, mentioned here. Uh, we're all uh, aware of both the extreme motions, uh, typically very high rotation uh, rates, um, and the high G-slam impacts. This is, the, this is what's driving the uh, health and safety issues that we're all talking about, or many of our presentations are talking about. Uh, these are pictures from last year's HSBO, um, and um, they really help to get the idea across of where these impacts are coming from. This is just jumping wakes, which is a lot different than running through a regular seaway. Um, but the uh, shock, mitigation, shock mitigation in general has a variety of approaches. We're talking specifically about seats in this presentation and this project, uh, but we can't forget that there's decks and there's other more complicated multi multiple seat options for for getting shock mitigation, and whatever is most appropriate is investigated, uh, and uh, we think, especially for special operations forces, um, we're really uh, serious about providing better protection. We have good protection now in general, but we want to make it better and more effective. Um, generally, vertical protection is adequate. We've seen examples or discussions about bottoming out, which is not a good situation. Um, we'll talk a little bit later. Liam's going to talk about some of the uh, the basic passive as well as the computer controlled semi-active and active systems that are around now, uh, which offer different levels of uh, capability, we hope. Um, lateral protection, um, and Johan was talking earlier in his presentation about depending on how your torso is supported, it may be just your neck that's affected, uh, which I think is shown in this, uh, which I think this is from the Human Factors Design Guideline, Trevor, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll briefly talk about the seat test and evaluation program that we uh, began uh, recently, uh, go through its goals, and then uh, talk about a few things that were introduced at this NATO, at this uh, RENA conference last year. The goal is simple, I think, is to reduce the risk of acute and chronic injuries to Canadian forces, that's the CF personnel, in particular uh, special operations forces, but this is all applicable to ribs and small fast boats throughout the naval environment. We want to try to improve the uh, state of the art for shock mitigation technology itself. Um, industry in the last year and a half has put a lot of very new, uh, much more complex systems on the market, which, which um, wasn't really anticipated, I think, by a lot of people a year and a half ago. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with those and what they can do. So actually, the state of the art is progressing fairly rapidly now. We want to really be able to write our acquisition requirement specifications correctly, both so that we can have performance specifications to acquire seats, but also methodologies and criteria that are understandable by the suppliers to demonstrate compliance with these criteria. Um, and that, that's one of the main focuses, especially that, that's where the scientific community meets the acquisition community who's working for the operational community. It's a, it's a very key area and a lot of people don't uh, spend enough focus on how you write these requirements and we're trying to do that. Um, and in the process, um, we're trying to establish new methods for modeling and simulation of the seats and their role in the boats and the interaction with the humans, um, and test and evaluation. And this, this presentation is focusing on the test and evaluation, uh, but it's within this larger framework, which is still only shock mitigation in, in terms of seats. There's a lot potentially going on. One thing that we've had to do, and, and I think Liam is going to show briefly a variety of different seats that we purchased, is to assure both our acquisition people in the government and also the suppliers of the equipment that this is not a pre-selection. We're not comparing different seats to say this is the best. Um, I think we're evolving a better understanding that different seats have different application areas uh, 
that they're best, well, best suited for. Um, that's briefly what I'll talk about in a moment. We've, we've identified five phases for this uh, test and evaluation program. Currently, the first three are all underway. Um, essentially, benchmarking contemporary technologies is a fancy way to say we went up, we bought 22 seats from four different manufacturers, and we're checking them out. Um, the test capabilities, uh, we've got two people here, uh, Colin and Sylvain from the Naval Engineering Test Establishment in Montreal, uh, which is really an environmental and shock and blast kind of a test place for naval uh, equipment. And we're trying to modify their, their large device, which I think, Liam, you've got a picture of, to do some single impact classical mechanical analysis um, tests with these seats. So you did one big half sine pulse and, and see uh, how its passive uh, response uh, behaves, and there's other simple tests we can use. Um, and simultaneously, we're having mathematical models developed. Liam is working on some. We have some university uh, students, master's programs are, are working in these areas. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is actually very similar to what was discussed in the uh, paper from uh, Tasmanian uh, work, working group report that was earlier on in, the, the, I think, the first presentation of the event. Um, talking about vessel classes and exposure severity classes, um, essentially, this was articulated in the paper. This is Tom Gunston's contribution, or one of his contributions to the paper. He's the UK um, delegate to the ISO 2631 Part 5 um, standard, which is what the set 8 that we've talked about previously in a variety of um, presentations, that's where it's from, is that uh, Part 5. Um, and he's found that um, categorizing the different uh, aspects of performance, um, and we've, we've got anchor points here describing sort of commercial through to military, um, and in terms of representative speeds. And since seeing the presentation from Tasmania, which is sort of a speed-based uh, uh, categorization as well, I think if you, if you look at this not as calm water speed, but speed in a challenging seaway, that might actually be a good way to, to segregate these things. And as somebody else said, that when you're in a commercial environment and it's rough, you don't go or you go slow. Um, as you go up to search and rescue in military, the urgency becomes higher too and you're prepared to take more risk to maintain that speed. So that's maybe one way we can, um, um, this is always evolving, so it's, uh, these presentations are, are, these events are good for this, you know, you, you really think about what's going on. Um, now, we also introduced something in the paper as well, which is sort of a, a parallel structure of the uh, severity of the exposure that you actually experience. The first one is what you intend or what you anticipate. And when you put the two of them together, um, this really becomes the basis for risk mitigation, risk assessment. I think we're seeing a lot of problems in the commercial sector with acute injuries when you have a craft that's both operated and has equipment suitable for, you know, a, a certain market segment. But when they encounter an extreme exposure, an extreme slam event, the people aren't trained, they're not physically fit in the right way, and really serious injuries occur. This does not, and this was talked about earlier, does not seem to be so characteristic of the military environment and also the search and rescue professional environment where they're much more well trained and aware. Similarly, when you have equipment designed for a military application and you're using it in a very benign environment, it may not be performing all that well because it's optimized for a much more aggressive environment. And these are things to keep uh, in the back of your mind as you're doing this work. And this might be one area that computer controlled seats can offer some ability to tailor the seat performance for a very wide uh, range of operations. But that, that's yet to be determined. One last thing I'll, I'll say, which is also a very common theme here, is the EU directive on um, exposure to vibration and repeated shock. Um, it appears to me reasonable to say that that is more applicable in terms of the values they're talking about and the, 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 the people that it's uh, applied to to fit more to the commercial environment. Even though they do experience the extreme loads, that's often the result of a mistake or an unanticipated condition. Um, and this can help to sort of explain, I think, why in search and rescue and in military operations, we're operating at such higher levels of exposure um, because it's really a different kind of an operating environment. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you very much and I'll turn it over to Liam Gannon, who's also from Defense Research and Development Canada. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Maybe right there. Am I on there? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Well, that covers about um, 10 out of our 15 minutes with 45 slides, so <laughs> see how, uh, how fast I can do these. Oops. <coughs> um, 
Well, there are a number of different uh, suspension seat technologies um, available, um, and they can be classified, and this is also included in the ARENA paper that Jim referenced earlier, as a passive, adaptive, semi-active, and active seats. And I'll just go through quickly uh, what those, what those uh, terms mean as far as the seat technologies go. So for passive suspensions, they're uh, pre-tuned. Uh, they're not really adjustable, and they typically consist of um, a spring and a damper. And there are no electronics or uh, external power associated with those suspensions. Um, and so some of the challenges that we see with those is that since they're not adjustable, they might bottom out, and that uh, can subject the occupants to really high accelerations. Um, and also, if there's a light occupant in them, that's the technical term I think Jim put in this slide, they can uh, bounce up and down uh, quite a bit. Uh, doing doing is the correct term, I think we decided, yeah. Um, and then there's, for uh, adaptive suspensions, these are the ones that have uh, adjustments for the uh, damping and maybe for uh, Pring's preload. Um, they can be uh, manual or automatic, but uh, they do not have any kind of uh, continuous control. And by automatic, I mean that you might have a seat with, say, uh, three spring stiffness settings um, and that can be adjusted based on uh, what the uh, seat is experiencing and measuring with the sensor, but they're still not controlled in, in real time by a sensor uh, and a computer system. So the challenges are similar to the passive seats, but uh, a little less restrictive. Um, the semi-active seats usually have uh, some sort of computer control sensors built into them. Um, they uh, have some real-time control characteristics and they work by removing energy um, from the system through uh, some sort of damping. Um, they include motion sensors, a processor, and uh, possibly uh, an actuator to um, change the uh, orifice size and a damper or something like that. Um, and there are different possible control strategies, which makes understanding this, the uh, behavior of these seats kind of difficult because the, uh, the people that produce the uh, suspension components, for example, uh, Lord produces uh, electro or magnetorheological suspensions that have uh, little ferrous particles in the dampers, and they subject those to a, an electromagnetic field and that can change the viscosity of the damper fluid um, very quickly and in, in real time. And they don't really, I don't think, want to share the algorithms that they use to control those. So it's going to be difficult in testing them and understanding uh, how they'll react to uh, real high-speed boat motions instead of kind of signal impact things, which is the stage we're, we're in right now. Um, and so the, uh, the challenges for those seats is that there is some external power requirement to run those uh, different systems, the computer and the sensors. They're more complex, and so if uh, any part of the system fails, then we need to understand exactly what's going to happen. Is there a fail-safe mode or how it might affect the seat occupant? And if that might actually make the ride worse and increase the risk of injury to the occupants, uh, we're not quite sure. Um, and then the last is active suspension, and those have an actual uh, force uh, element in them, um, and they actually add energy to the system to uh, counteract the, uh, the displacements and the accelerations in the, in the suspension system. Um, they can also remove energy through, in the system through uh, damping elements. They include the same sorts of things as the, uh, the semi-active seats, so they'll have sensors, um, uh, processors, actuator controls, and there are, again, different types of control strategies which we may or may not and most likely won't have access to. Um, they're a little more complicated, again, because they require a higher external power, which isn't always available in high-speed boats, especially if you have a high number of seats. They're more complex, so there are more bits in them to break, and then understanding the failure modes um, becomes an important factor for those seats as well. Um, so Jim mentioned this. I think this is a duplication of his slide, actually. Um, so this is the uh, just kind of a rundown of the test and evaluation program that we're doing currently. Um, and we bought a different uh, number of uh, seats by different manufacturers with different suspension components, which is an important thing, too, to understand how the different uh, types of seats and the suspension co components will behave. And um, here's uh, just a couple pictures. The, uh, these ones here, I think, have air springs in them, um, and then these ones, you can see there's coil springs, so it's more like a coil-over suspension you might have in a car. Um, and, of course, we're all familiar with those, since they're on a, a number of the boats that we are on over the last few days. Um, and so what we're going to do to uh, test those seats is they'll, the testing will be done at NIDI, which is the Naval Engineering Test Establishment in Montreal, and it's, uh, it's going to be a single impact test, so each uh, of the 22 seats um, there's 11 different types, and we have two of each so that we can ensure that we have repeatable results. And we'll hit each one with three impacts at each of three different uh, G levels. And we're working on exactly what we can get out of the testing device as far as those G levels go right now. 
and um, then we'll kind of tailor the uh, shock pulse to try to get something that's uh, similar to what we're seeing in the, uh, the in, uh, measurements from the high-speed boats. Um, so we'll have uh, three series of tests for each of those seats. Uh, there's going to be a, a set that's uh, hard-mounted to the uh, shock platform, and then there will be uh, two other tests, and they'll use resilient mounts, which I'll show in a minute. They're wire rope uh, isolators, which uh, soften the connection between where the shock is applied and the base of the seat, so we can spread out that, uh, the shock pulse duration a little more. So uh, we're going to do nine, nine impacts per seat, uh, three different mounting configurations for uh, 27 impacts uh, altogether for each seat. So uh, it'll add up to a fair number. So this is what the device looks like. There's a 3,000 pound hammer that can be raised as high as 5.5 feet, I think. And uh, we don't need to do that for uh, these seats because I think that adds up to an acceleration of about 600 G or something like that. So we really only need to use a few inches for the uh, hammer drop height. Um, and the original purpose for this machine was for uh, shock testing shipboard equipment uh, for uh, survivability purposes. So this is kind of what we want to do. Uh, the high peaky red one is what we'll hopefully get out of a rigidly mounted uh, seat that's hit by a, a high amplitude short duration acceleration. And then we'll spread that out by adding uh, these resilient uh, mounts, the wire rope isolators to kind of soften the shock pulse, um, extend the duration and lower the amplitude. So we'll have three kind of different uh, shock pulses that we we'll use on those seats. Um, and the purpose of all this is, is, first of all, to understand how the different suspensions and seats uh, behave and how to characterize the behavior and understand uh, what, uh, how we could test them so we can specify kind of a rational testing method that can be reproduced um, by manufacturers or, or seat suppliers so that could, they could prove uh, compliance with a possible uh, future uh, standard or with the uh, procurement uh, requirements. So um, part of the thing that we can get out of that, though, is we'll get the uh, acceleration, velocity, displacement, time histories out of those seats after we hit them with the shock pulses. And we can use that to do some mathematical modeling, um, which uh, we've done a bit of with uh, MATLAB and Simul Simulink, and that'll uh, carry on into the future. And so we can idealize the seats using a single degree of freedom mass spring damper systems. Um, and those basically uh, characterize, are they, uh, that's a Z on. Um, the, we can uh, include the spring stiffness characteristic, a damping component, and uh, the mass of the seat occupant to put those all into an equation and put an acceleration time history as an input to feed that model to understand how it might behave. So uh, we can validate these models using the seat testing data. And for the more complicated uh, mass spring, or uh, especially the air springs or springs that have combined gas and oil, they're fairly complicated to model. Um, basic, using physics-based models, but the lab testing can help us to characterize their behavior to plug into these models and then see uh, how we might change the uh, suspension element characteristics to optimize the different seats for uh, reducing the risk of injury to the high-speed boat operators. Um, and we can also uh, study a bunch of, as I mentioned, the different characteristics. This is just an example of a shock response spectrum that we can uh, calculate using the numerical models to look at all the different possible spring stiffnesses, which are more or less equivalent to the natural frequency. The stiffer the spring, the uh, higher the natural frequency uh, moving left to right there in the bottom of the plot. So that kind of gives us an idea of how a seat might behave for a particular time history that we've measured on a boat. Um, and we can kind of identify what type of uh, damper characteristics and um, spring characteristics might be uh, ideally suited to reduce the accelerations, the, displ uh, the displacements, or uh, the risk of injury as well to the occupants. And uh, this is just kind of a rough uh, look at how we might reduce the risk of injury or how we can use those models to reduce the risk of injury to uh, boat operators and occupants. Um, this is based on an acceleration time history. It was about five seconds long that we plugged into that math model. And uh, this is, one was about uh, four Gs, I think was the peak acceleration for about three slams over the five seconds. And the other one, the high amplitude one, was about 10 to 15 Gs. Uh, for the uh, peak accelerations. And so that the, uh, the DZ value is the acceleration dose value from the ISO 2631 uh, Part 5 standard. And the next step in that would be to calculate the Z8. Um, but I think this kind of illustrates the point in that using these models, we can feed in acceleration time histories measured in boats um, and calculate uh, what kind of acceleration dose the occupants might see or what the risk of injury could be um, as a function of the seat characteristics, like the uh, spring stiffness or the uh, damping characteristics for the uh, dampers that are in the suspension. Um, and so the way ahead is to, d to test the, uh, once we're finished testing the seats, we'll probably take them apart and have a more detailed look at the individual components that make up the suspension systems to test those individually. Um, so we can plug those into our, our math models wherever we like. 
Um, and that seed data, again, can be used to verify the numerical models to make sure they're actually giving us realistic answers um, that we can rely on. And then uh, the next step will be um, to figure out a way for testing the semi-active and active seeds because if we just subject them to a single impact, it's really hard to say whether or not they're going to behave in the same way as they would when they're out in a boat um, actually subjected to multiple uh, slam impacts and repeated impacts. I think their control algorithms will probably work differently um, in those two different situations. And so we're looking at developing a testing method where we might be able to re reproduce realistic uh, accelerations, displacements, and velocities like we're uh, measuring in high-speed boats to understand how those uh, semi-active and active seats work. And that's kind of the, the next step in this testing project. And I'll conclude with that. If I take any questions, yeah.